Yeah, sure. That's all I would, that's all I, 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 I repeat what I am told to do, okay? <laughs> what so, are you supposed to do if someone says yes? Huh? If someone says yes. Come and talk to me. Okay, <laughs> I mean, that's the second part of it. <laughs> Apparently there was a list written on a blackboard on the pros and cons of suicide. I am just telling you. Ooh. I'm I'm <laughs> <laughs> holding in my hand uh, a survey that we made up. I'm going to pass it around. Uh, I don't want to, I'm not going to look at it until next week. And then Arlen and I and uh, Sherry will sit down and stare at it and try to figure out what to do next year. Uh, I'm going to pass this around and you can either give it to one of us and get around to filling it out before you leave town, or I'll put a folder out there by the. Uh, <laughs> okay, now I get to be the, the one with the squeegee, so watch out if you're in the front row. Um, so so the, um, the, the subject of my talks is the black hole information problem, and I um, should see how late I started so I can argue with the session chair, okay. Um, but the larger question that underlies this is, what is the theory of quantum gravity? Um, and of course, for quantum gravity, string theory is a pretty good start. Um, let's draw some couple of string graphs here. Um, it solves the, the problem of the non-normalizability of gravity. Um, it does a lot of other good things. Uh, but the reason that we're not done, the reason that we weren't done, whatever, 30 years ago, um, well, the main reason is that it's just a perturbation theory. Uh, as in quantum field theory, this series uh, doesn't converge. It doesn't define the theory. And we know that quantum systems usually have a lot of um, interesting and important phenomena, phenomena uh, that the perturbative series doesn't capture. In the standard model, we have quark confinement and chiral symmetry breaking and electroweak, baryon and lepton number violation, and none of them appear in the sum of Feynman graphs, but they're all there. So in the case of quantum field theory, um, this problem uh, was also faced. It was originally understood as a diagrammatic theory, and, and it was really Wilson, I think, who sort of enunciated this problem in the 60s um, and, and solved it. He said that uh, what this is an approximation to um, is basically the path integral, but moreover, the path integral as defined by the renormalization group. Now, um, uh, the, the most direct, if we were trying to sort of learn from history, the most direct thing, therefore, to try in string theory uh, would be something like string field theory. 
Um, but so far, string field theory doesn't really seem to have, it has some elegant features, but it doesn't really seem to have given out much more than is put into it. It doesn't seem like it points the way to the solution to this problem. It seems like we need something uh, more imaginative. And we found something more imaginative um, by way of dualities. So um, string theory, we now believe, is dual to uh, quantum mechanical systems, the Banks, Fischler, Schenker, Susskind matrix theory, and a year later, ADS-CFT duality. And um, for example, in principle, in principle, these qu and quantum field theories and quantum mechanical systems are again things that we have an exact definition of, a la Wilson. And if these, if this duality is correct, um, then then in fact, hidden within this quantum mechanics or quantum field theory are both the individual terms of this expansion, the things you learn how to calculate uh, in string theory, and also the exact amplitudes to which these are the the asymptotic series. Of course, these theories are strongly coupled, so only in sort of limits can one really see this structure emerge, but actually numerical work is progressing and, and there's every reason to believe the full theory, the full theory is in there. Now, now uh, there's lots of reasons we're not done, but the main reason is that these dualities construct string theory or quantum gravity only in very special space times Space times, in particular, have very special boundary conditions. Um, they don't include cosmological space times. They don't include realistic compactifications. And even though we've had these now for 20 years, it seems as though we're missing one or more concepts to extend these lessons to a full, a full theory. Now, um, to get to where we've gotten, Thinking about black hole quantum mechanics has been a, a very useful thing. Um, thinking about the black hole entropy and what is, it, what is its statistical origin and about the information problem really forced people to think about the relation between D brains and black brains, which was eventually crystallized by uh, Maldacena as, as ADS-CFT duality. And you can ask the question, do we have more to learn um, from thinking about black hole quantum mechanics? Well, actually, the, the inside of a black hole is a lot like a cosmology. The geometry is not static. There's a singularity. So uh, maybe it's a good thing to think about the inside of a black hole. Uh, what are the open questions? Well, so as I will review, the, these dualities imply that information is not lost. They imply that Hawking's original um, bold claim is wrong, but they don't explain what was wrong with his argument. And, and we still, after 40 years, don't know what was wrong with his argument. So there's kind of a, a, um, a challenge there. And people have continued to push on this problem after the dualities. Um, and, and of course, the most recent thing is, is this AMPS argument, where a few years ago, basically by taking Hawking's original argument and kind of running it backwards, reverse engineering it, it um, argued that um, if, in fact, information is not lost, then quantum gravity as an effective field theory. That was the f so okay. Um, basically, um, you know, a black hole. The, the, the information problem only deals with the black hole at times when it's large and its curvature is small, where you would think gravity would be valid as an effective field theory. Somehow that assumption must break down in some way we still can't quantify. And the AMPS argument says that it breaks down if, in a rather serious way right at the black hole horizon. And, and, and so I'll talk about that and what the alternatives um, might be. Um, I should mention um, entanglement. You've heard that word a lot. Um, it's remarkable how entanglement and entanglement entropy are, are, have become central to many fields. Um, with the Ryu Takayanagi conjecture, they are playing a central net role now in understanding how space time emerges from dual theories. Um, as you heard this morning, uh, in condensed matter physics, they're playing an essential role 
in understanding exotic phases of condensed matter systems. Entanglement plays a key role in quantum information theory, where it is a resource. It's basically the currency, I guess, of quantum information. And entanglement also is key to the information paradox. So it's this incredible convergence of ideas. Just as an aside, I was here 10 years ago, five years ago, the last formal TASI, which was, a big component of which was applications of ADS CFT, including condensed matter physics. And I cannot rem remember the word entanglement coming up even once. Tom is also shaking his head, which is, and, and Oliver, which is rather remarkable when you consider what you've heard uh, during, during these four weeks. The words you heard a lot about were hydrodynamics, I think, that was probably the most prominent thing, and, and, and um, quantum critical points. But somehow entanglement hadn't surfaced, surfaced even, even though Ryu Takinagi was then about three years old, it hadn't really risen to the surface. But now, actually, there's this tremendous sense of tremendous convergence, and one can't know where it will be, but it certainly reminds me of sort of the convergence of ideas that led to ADS-CFT duality itself. So um, what I'm going to do today is to start at the beginning, talk about the black hole geometry, um, derive Hawking radiation, start uh, describing the information paradox, probably not finish. And then in lecture two, I'll finish talking about um, the information paradox and start talking about what we learn about it from, from ADS CFT. And I encourage you to ask lots of questions. OK, so um, the black hole metric. So here's the Schwarzschild metric. in four dimensions, to pick a random number. Um, and to get some conventions straight, R sub S is the Schwarzschild metric, 2GM, M is the black hole mass, and so I'm working in units where you, I'll keep the G's, uh, but H bar, C, and I guess also Boltzmann's constant are one. So for example, Newton's constant is equal to the Planck length squared or to the Planck mass uh, to the minus two. So um, the first thing that I want to do is to um, work to, to see a little bit. So, so of course, um, Juan and Mark have scrawled black holes all over the blackboard. Uh, but I'm going to need more than the picture. I'm going to need some of the coordinate systems and all. And so I want to actually go through um, how one sees that the apparent singularity at r equals r sub s uh, is actually just a coordinate singularity. Um, so let's focus on um, the geometry near the Schwarzschild radius. Let's expand r equals r sub s plus delta and keep only the leading terms everywhere. And the metric goes to a linear piece, a piece that's one over. Uh, linear piece, and then plus just the metric of a sphere. Uh, I probably won't keep writing the sphere piece for now, because it's always going to be the same, but let me keep massaging. So, so this will always be implicit. Uh, let's keep massaging. Oh, by the way, I've put, in case you haven't seen, uh, the notes that I'm lecturing from, uh, which are a work in progress, I, I've, are on the, 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 the TASI website, and I'll update them every day or two. OK, um, so um, this doesn't quite look familiar. Um, to make it look a little bit more familiar, I'm going to redefine delta is rho squared over 4 r sub s. And then this becomes um, 
minus rho squared over 4 r sub s squared dt squared plus d rho squared. And then I'll, again, leave off the series. Now, this, this might look almost familiar, but it will look even more familiar if instead of considering this geometry, we consider uh, the corresponding Euclidean geometry, where we just analy analytic continue t goes to i t Euclidean. Um, and um, oops, I guess actually the minus i t Euclidean is a, not that it really matter. And then this becomes rho squared over 4 r sub s squared uh, d t sub e squared plus d sub rho squared, which is just the metric of two dimensions in polar coordinates uh, if we, if we uh, define theta. I've already used theta, uh, psi, I guess. That's an angle. So if we define psi to be t sub e over 2 that's r sub s, r sub s, then this just becomes the, the um, metric of the, of, of the plane in polar coordinates. And so this point, uh, delta equals 0, which becomes rho equals 0, is in fact just a, a coordinate singularity of, of polar coordinates. The Euclidean case in a second, because it's interesting in its own right, but watch, let me, let me um, well, yeah, actually, actually, let me first continue with the Euclidean case. So in the Euclidean case, then what we want to do is we would want to define x to be rho cosine of that angle, y to be rho sine of that angle. And so then the Euclidean metric just becomes dx squared plus dy squared. Near the horizon, plus the spherical part, plus the parts higher corrections as you move further out. Um, so in the Minkowski space, we're going to define then x to be rho cosh t over two r sub s t to be rho cinch t over two r sub s, and now d s squared is just um, d minus dt squared plus dx squared. So again, again, the apparent singularity at rho equals 0 uh, is a coordinate singularity. And here are some nice coordinates which are completely smooth at the origin. Um, question, please. So why are we demanding that the conical? Well, I haven't really quite demanded that, that. You're jumping ahead. Let me, let, I mean, I, I used. Ah, well, I'm sorry. I I haven't told you yet what the range of psi is. So so far, I'm just doing it. You're you're, you're correct. That's a good question. I postponed it by not saying what the range of psi is. I just just as a matter of change. Okay, but but okay, good good. So so as, I suppose if you're right, if psi had the wrong range, then the origin would still be a singularity. We'll come back to that. In the Lorentzian case, there is no analog. T, because we have cinches and cautious, T is not a periodic variable. So I, I, that's why I deferred that. There's no, there's no periodicity here. And so, and so but, but what, the, what there is in the, in the um, Minkowski case that you don't see in the Euclidean case, and I guess I'll, I'll put that here because I don't mind covering it up later. Let's um, oops, draw. Uh, again, this global coordinate t and this global coordinate x. And the region that these coordinates cover, you see, is when x is greater than the magnitude of t, uh, which means they don't cover the entire. Um, they only cover uh, region 1 here. They only cover region 1 here, um, where x is greater than the magnitude of t. But the full metric, the full metric then has these regions 
uh, additional regions, 1, 2, 3, and 4. Um, it's also, also useful to go to light cone coordinates where u increases in this direction. Sorry uh, that it's dark. Uh, that's a capital U. V increases in that direction. Um, and so um, U is just T plus. Actually, I always forget which is which, so let me, um, let me look at my notes. U is T minus X. Actually, while I'm at it, I'll write it in terms. This is minus rho uh, e to the minus t over r sub s. Um, and v is t plus x, uh, which is rho e to the t over r sub s. Notice, by the way, that the relation between these global coordinates and the time that we began with, the time which goes over to ordinary time far away from the black hole is exponential, something which is going to come up, um, of course, significantly um, later on. OK, so again, staying with the um, Lorentzian case, so, so, so far I've just, just to, to make the expression simpler, focused on the region of the apparent singularity. But there is a, a corresponding um, um, uh, coordinate transformation for the full geometry. I think maybe I'll do what Mariangelo did and say, I'm just going to stand here until you derive it. No? OK. Uh, <laughs> the S squared is, oh, all right, before I, um, yeah, sorry. So, so by the way, in terms of my light like coordinates, this metric becomes minus du dv. And I'm going to write the full geometry. Um, I'll try to put this, I'll try to at the very bottom of the board. And um, all of these equations are online. But now the fun part, I get to draw some pictures. So I think I'll put the pictures on this board over here. Um, yeah. So we're not going to have much use for the full expression. Um, it's really going to be the near horizon geometry that, that, um, that controls the, the interesting physics. Um, OK, so um, let me draw then. I drew, I drew the, I guess it's already covered up, the little uv. Uh, something I can raise, yes. So, so here is the u-axis. Here is the v-axis. They go on, everything goes on to infinity in these directions, but here we have singularities, uh, which you see the singularities are when little r is zero. Oops, there's a factor of r sub s here. I forgot. When uv and uh, when little r is zero, and so uv is r sub s squared. Now, now, uh, in order to fit the picture into a more compact space, um, one can simply do a, a reparameterization of u and v, just to basically to pull infinity into finite distance. Uh, and that's how it's usually drawn as a Penrose diagram. So um, this is u equals minus infinity. This is u equals 0. This is u equals infinity. Uh, this is v equals minus infinity. 
v equals zero and v equals infinity. Okay, so um, actually that's probably not the picture that um, that uh, that that Juan and um, and Mark drew. They probably drew. This is Schwarzschild, but they drew Schwarzschild ADS. which is the same in the horizon region, but different asymptotically. For today, I'll be focusing on black holes that are in flat space, and so I'll be thinking about this picture, and then in the next lecture, I'll be thinking about this picture that, that I've just drawn. And the big difference, of course, is that here, Remember, in Penrose diagrams, light rays move at 45 degrees. So in this picture, light rays leave the past horizon, this is the past horizon, and escape, or they come in from, from infinity and hit the future horizon. Here, something that leaves the past horizon hits the boundary and falls back into the black hole. So that's, that's the big thing about ADS space, is that light-like trajectories can reach the boundary and come back again in, in finite time. Now, again, Juan and Mark were very focused on what I've drawn here, which is kind of the maximum vacuum solution to Einstein's equations. And it has, it, what it is is it's actually two black holes, this one and one over here, or here. Um, connected by an Einstein-Rosen bridge. So the geometry kind of narrows and then gets big again as you move through. And I get confused by two-sided black holes. I think that there are conceptual issues that we just haven't understood yet. Maybe I'm wrong. But, but um, I think conceptually it's much easier to think about having a single, you know, Start with the simplest topology. Think about a single Minkowski space or a single ADS space and bringing it together enough matter um, to form a black hole and then watching what it does. So, so that's a, a one-sided um, geometry. In terms of these pictures, the infolding matter would be following some trajectory like that. Oops, I want to draw it light-like, uh, time-like rather. So. It would be following some trajectory like that. And only um, this part of the black hole geometry above the infilling matter would be relevant. The part below would be replaced by just the smooth space time that exists, the empty space time that exists, the empty one sided space time that exists before the black hole formed. And for most purposes, we don't care about the transients that occur right after the black hole forms. We, can, we study the black hole long after it's formed, and so we can kind of do a boost on these coordinates where this infolding body is pushed back almost to the, um, this past horizon. And so our geometry is primarily regions uh, one and two. Good. And we're not so sure about two. Um, OK. So now let me return to the Euclidean black hole and the question that was asked. And so indeed, um, if you um, just, as, just, as, just, just at the level of changing variables, um, the Schwarzschild metric becomes the metric on the plane in terms of, in terms of um, these, these um, coordinates. But now you see this coordinate, this, this, this is only well defined. It's only smooth, at least, at the origin uh, if t has the right periodicity. That is, um, if 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 so, so we only if T sub e uh, is periodic, 
with period 4 pi r sub s. If that, if we consider, so let's, let's consider, let's consider again this geometry I've described here with that periodicity. Um, then what the geometry looks like is this out at infinity, the time direction is periodic with the indicated periodicity. And as we move in, the time direction, because GTT is going to zero uh, when we get to R sub s, the geometry pinches off. And precisely, precisely if um, the, we consider Euclidean geometry with this periodicity, um, then the metric here near the tip is just this smooth metric and the whole space is smooth. And now what, what, what is this good for? Well, let's imagine that we now do the path integral for quantum fields, for some quantum field on this space. What is it describing? So you know, as, as you know, I think a, a, a path integral with a periodic Euclidean uh, time is actually calculating a thermodynamic partition function. It's calculating, so if, if t is periodic t plus beta, uh, this is like calculating the trace of e to the minus uh, beta h, because h generates the translation in the, h generates the, without the i, generates the Euclidean translation, and with the periodic identification produces the trace. So, so it, when, we, when, we, when we calculate the path integral on this space and various perturbations of you know, adding in sources and so on, uh, we're calculating a, a thermodynamic, we're calculating equal, equilibrium thermal properties. And what this geometry is telling us is that the path integral on this space describes a black hole in equilibrium with um, thermal radiation of um, ah, so beta is one over the temperature. So it, this, it's describing a black hole in equilibrium with uh, with quantum fields at temperature T sub H, uh, which equal one over the periodicity. You know, you can ask what. So you can ask what if you took a different periodicity and put a conic singularity there, uh, what would that path integral mean? Um, and I'm not sure. It's a question that comes up now and then. But this is, this, this is the claim. And in fact, we're going to, so, so this leads us to the conclusion, well, if, if it's true that a black hole can exist in equilibrium with a gas at finite temperature, of course, there's going to constantly be quanta falling into the black hole, and it must be therefore true that there are constantly quanta emerging from the black hole, um, and so the black hole must have a temperature. Sorry. Yes, yes. Presumably, this reasoning also works for ADS black holes. Yes, it does. Yes, it, so so um, um, let me think if I anything to say there. So. Um, So, so by, by how to define it mean because of the scaling? So, um, said, so, so um, when you, if we're talking about global ADS, then the field theory lives on a three sphere, and in effect, all temperatures are in units of the radius of the three sphere. Um, I'll try to remember that question and come back to it when we actually talk about ADS black holes. Because to be honest, I always have to remind myself how this works. Um, because there is this infinite warp redshift factor. But, but let, 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 me, let me, in fact, um, return to that. Another question? Sorry, Joe. Sorry. Yes? So this issue about the kind of singularity. A slick way to say that your original solution does not have any source. Yeah, I guess you want, it's not really a solution to Einstein's equation. It's right. It's, it, I mean, maybe the simplest answer to say is if you put the kind of singularity, it's not a solution to Einstein's equations. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. If you try to differentiate with respect to temperature, that's when you start thinking about this geometry, but I don't like to do that. Question, please. Yeah. 
Well, it, I'm, I'm, so I'm saying, ah. Well, I mean, I, the assertion is that, well, let me just make the physical assertion, then I'm not sure. If, if we put a black hole um, in a space filled with gas whose temperature is equal to the temperature of the black hole, those two things will exist in equilibrium. The amount falling into the black hole will be exactly balanced by the amount coming out. So I, I think. Oh, I, I'm sorry. Oh, oh sorry. Excuse, uh, excuse me. Very good point. Very good point. There is a higher order. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Right. No, no, you're right. There is a higher order of. Right. The gas. Ha thank you. I, I spoke too quickly. The gas itself has energy. It back reacts. It, 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 it changes the geometry. So in fact. This is this 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 is some limit in which that effect has been made small. Thank you. I hadn't thought about that, but you're quite right. Um, yeah, maybe. I mean, right. We can start putting it in a box so that there's a limit to where. That, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. Let, let, yeah. Good. good. Let me let me not pursue the logic of that too far because the conclusion is right. That's all that matters. Um, and, 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 and as Shanta suggests, there is some order of limits in which the derivation is true, too. In any case, I'm gonna, what I want to do um, next is to actually study explicitly Hawking quantization and see the production of Hawking radiation, but I wanted to, to uh, preview it in this way. Um, yet, uh, I have to think about, um, again, this gives you right. This so this gives you a certain limit of the problem, and in particular, in particular, if you're if you're interested in um, correlation functions, Euclidean correlation functions in the presence of the black hole, this is a correct way to calculate them in some limit. But but there yeah. Good. So, so if if I if I if I had a nice way to cut off the space, the back reaction wouldn't get too large, and I cut off with ADS. But then I have to remember the answer to the question I already deferred about how we normalize the temperature in ADS. Yeah. Uh, you mean here or ever anywhere? Oh, sorry, pardon in the world. Oh gosh. Um, what a question. Aren't you using infinite warp factors and stuff in your talk? No, you're actually not using ADS. I guess. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, what can I say? I don't know. This is a yeah. Um. So, so um, at this hand waving level, we've. Uh, I'll ask you the same question during your talk. Um, at this hand waving level, we've concluded that the black hole has a temperature. And, and therefore, by, by thermodynamic relations, um, it has an entropy. dS is dT over m. And again, we have that um, m, we, we, we have again that m is, um, is 2gm is r sub s. This is r sub s over 2g. Um, and so uh, we can integrate this and conclude uh, that S is um, pi r sub s squared over g, which is the area of the horizon over 4g. And this fact is much more general, much more general than, um, than um, the 
the specific Schwarzschild black hole, it seems to be a property of all black hole horizons, even for charged and, and rotating black holes. OK, so um, shortly, actually, or maybe it's now. Yeah, let me. Um, So yeah, let me actually try to um, ask what this entropy might be because it's an old, so so this and so in, in thermodynamics statistical mechanics entropy counts the number of available states of a system and um, and so so uh, if I ask you what is entropy counting you're going to start telling me about d1 brains and d5 brains or whatever your favorite brain construction is. But actually, it's worth remembering that, that um, long ago, um, Bekenstein, before even Hawking, inferred the existence of this entropy. And I'll, I'll, I'll review his argument. And I'm not sure there's a lot of strange things about it, but it's useful to kind of set the stage for some later discussion. So again, I'm drawing only the part of the black hole that I want, that is, the part that forms and collapse. And I want to consider a space-like slice. So it's less than 45 degrees, so it's space-like. Um, metrically, it's very, very long inside the black hole. This is a conformal diagram, and so as you approach this point, you're actually going, going infinitely far. Now, suppose we sit on the outside, and we start, well, suppose we start with a small black, before we, let's forget about radiation for now. Suppose we start with a small black hole, and we start feeding it quanta. And these quanta then end up on this slice. And let's suppose, OK, well, for each quantum, there's kind of of order one bit of information, maybe, which is sort of whether we throw it in or not, or maybe it has a spin, which way the spin points. And so the number of states, uh, the number of states, actually, let, let me um, write. The number of states available is of order e uh, to the number of particles that we throw in. Hmm? Bits or qubits, whatever. I'm just counting the log of the number of available states. I'm not being very precise here. In fact, I believe that Bekenstein's calculation, um, which I'm giving you, doesn't stand up to, cl to close scrutiny. So, so don't take it too seriously, but it's worth, it's worth having seen it. Um, OK, and so um, the, energy of each, the energy of each quantum, I'll call them quanta. The energy of each quantum, uh, in order to fit inside the black hole, its wavelength can't be uh, much longer than the size of the black hole. So its energy is of order 1 over r sub s. Um, and so what we have is that the change in the mass of the black hole is of order 1 over r sub s times uh, dn, the number of quanta that we've thrown in. And uh, dm is d of 2g r sub s. Um, and so uh, we can integrate. And we can, so, so inserting this, uh, we can integrate. And we can conclude um, that the number is of order r sub s squared over, over g, which is, again, uh, what we get from, from um, the Hawking temperature. So before Hawking, just by thinking about this, this thought experiment, he included that uh, if I start throwing bits into a black hole, um, the, the, there's, a, there's a sort of a limit to the information, the number of states, the information carrying capacity of the black hole, which indeed is just the statistical version of the Hawking entropy. I don't know if this argument has any validity at all. I think my colleague Don Moroff would say no. I mean, for one thing, well, two things. One is when the black hole starts evaporating, things get more complicated. Um, for another thing, for another thing, um, you can actually throw in more than one bit per quantum if you sort of throw them in slowly enough. And so I don't. I know that Bekenstein really tried to get the four. You know, try to get the actual number in here 
and, and thought he had some success. But, but this, this is a cartoon to remember. I don't know if, if it's actually going to play an ultimate role in our understanding of, of black hole entropy. OK. Um, but I'm going to draw pictures similar to this uh, later on when I get to the information problem. So now, let me um, do the calculation of, Hawking of, of, of production of Hawking quanta for you. And um, I think it's squeegee time. This one, this one does move up, right? Yes. Oh, OK. We have one more. Good. OK. Um, so actually, let me first, let me, let me first go back to my, my pictures. Um, so. Let me draw it bigger. So let's consider um, an observer who, who um, falls into a black hole. And another one who stays outside. And the infalling observer is sending, let's say, some regular signals like that. And they will only send a finite number of signals. Um, they will only send a finite number of signals uh, before they pass through the horizon. But if you're staying outside, clearly it's going to it's going to take an infinite amount of time for sort of the last pulse to reach you. So there's a very nonlinear relation between the proper time tau of the infalling observer and the time t uh, that appears in the Schwarzschild metric, the time of the asymptotic observer. In fact, uh, from the coordinate transformations, uh, you can readily see uh, that it's exponential. Um, that d tau is e to the minus um, t over r sub s dt. So, so for fixed d tau, dt gets exponentially long. For fixed dt, d tau gets exponentially small. Now, this nonlinear relation between these time coordinates means that if we take a quantum field, and we expand it in modes that are modes of given tau frequency or modes of given t frequency, there'll be a very nonlinear relation. In fact, there'll be a mixing of positive and negative frequencies. What one observer sees is purely positive, the other will see as mixed. And so in particular, the state that the infalling observer perceives as, as vacuum will be an excited state for the asymptotic observer. Um, also, something which plays an important role. So imagine that we're sitting, so, so when we're sitting on the outside, we're talking about modes that have a given frequency, which is of order one over the Schwarzschild radius. For this black hole, there's only one scale, its size, the corresponding time is, its light crossing time, the corresponding frequency is the inverse. So on the outside, everything we're talking about is at roughly the same scale, but so think of this as a delta t of order the Schwarzschild radius. The corresponding d tau is extremely short, becomes exponentially small. And so if we follow these modes back in time, 
the modes which are going to become the Hawking quanta have extraordinarily high frequencies when the infalling observer meets them. Okay. So, um, good. In fact, in fact, because this is fairly important. Um, okay. No. Yeah. Yeah. So, so I want. I want to. So, um, John mentioned the adiabatic principle, and the adiabatic principle is going to play um, an important role for me. So, let me actually hear. Um, in the center, um, talk about the adiabatic principle. Um, let's so, so the adiabatic principle says that if we have some Hamiltonian and its parameters are changing in time, as long as the rate of change is slow compared to the mean spacing of levels, then you will stay in the ground state with very high probability. The probability of exponential. Uh, the probability of uh, an excitation is exponentially small. So, again, the 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 actually, I guess Eva, you did this come up in her talk? It's a, it's a, so if I have if 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 the frequencies are changing at some rate, we form this uh, dimensionless parameter, uh, which is sort of the dimensionless rate of change of the Hamiltonian, and again, the probability of an excitation is exponentially small in this. Now, now um, where I'm going to use this is in this geometry. And let me, let me draw it in the center here. Um, I'm going to um, imagine choosing some set of, con not neither, well, actually, I guess maybe u plus v would Maybe u plus v would be a good time coordinate. But it's some time coordinate which basically doesn't do anything too singular at the horizon. And if we think about a quantum field, who, uh, and we think about sort of its Hamiltonian description in terms of this time, well, the Hamiltonian is changing uh, because the geometry in these coordinates is changing. But again, the, the scale, it's changing slowly in a certain sense. It's changing slowly because the characteristic scale here is, again, 1 over the Schwarzschild radius. Whereas I just emphasized the fact that the modes that we're talking about in the neighborhood of the horizon have frequencies much, much higher than the, um, than the, than the other characteristic scales because by this exponential blue shifting. So the modes that the modes that are going to become the Hawking quanta, when the infalling observer sees them, they are in their ground states. Okay, so I'm using the adiabatic principle. And it, it, this is this is this is um there's a lot more to say about this. Let me figure out if I want to say it now or later. I'll say it later. Because this is not the way that Hawking described the calculation. He did an he didn't appeal to the adiabatic principle. Um, this this appeal to the adiabatic principle I'm making actually comes. I think it was Ted Jacobson in a paper that's in the note that it's cited in the notes, uh, who first sort of organized the calculation in this way. Um, but I'll explain to you sort of why later on why I'm doing it, why why that why it's it's the way that things um, need to be done. So now. Now, uh, the calculation. So um, I'm going to, I, I think I've erased part of my metric. So I'm, I'm going to consider, I'm going to consider a one, to make calculations simple, I'm going to consider a massless scalar. In one plus one dimensions. And um, so I'm just going to drop the angular part. The metric is as before, but I'm going to drop the angular part. And um, so actually, let me, let me write the relevant part of the metric up there. Um, I've erased it, so I'll copy it. OK. 
But I want to introduce two sets of coordinates. So u and v, again, are the global coordinates. u and v are the coordinates that would naturally be used by the inflowing observer because they're smooth at, at um, the horizon. But I also want to write this this way, with the little u and little v, which you haven't seen before, um, are, are logarithmically related. And um, I guess to explain why I'm introducing them, let me introduce one more uh, this coordinate relation. Our star here is called the tortoise coordinate, and, and it's not the thing to focus on. The thing to focus on is that little u and little v are linear in the asymptotic time t. So the, the observer who falls through the horizon will naturally um, um, expand their fields in modes of given u and v frequency, capital U and capital V frequency, the observer who sits at infinity, which is flat space, will use the natural set of flat space modes, and so they will expand their fields in modes of given um, little u and little v frequency. And I see that I've painted myself into a corner here because that board doesn't raise. Um, boy, there's a lot of equations. Okay. Um, So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have to cover this up because I really want to write in the middle because there's kind of a lot of equations. But, um, you know, firewall papers and talks don't have enough equations, so this is why I'm doing this to you. But it's good to see it. Um, so so the, um, for a mass scale in one plus one dimensions, of course, the wave equation is really simple. It's partial u partial v of phi is 0. And because this relation is conformal, it just relates u to u and v to v, that's also the same in the global coordinates. And so the solution uh, is functions of, of u plus functions of v in either coordinate set. And we're interested in modes which are outgoing. So they're functions of u. And so in particular, um, I think you really don't need that again. And so in particular, um, the, the observer who falls through the horizon, so this is just the, 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 one, the right moving part of it. The observer who falls through the horizon is going to expand their modes, just the normal quantum field mode expansion. in terms of, again, cap of global, of the, of the uh, capital U frequency. While the observer who stays in infinity is going to expand those same modes in terms of the little u frequency. I'll call, so A is a is what the inflowing observer uses, B is what the asymptotic observer uses. Okay. Now, um, these are the same expansion, just two different, the same, two di same, the same field expanded in two different ways. And so by taking Fourier transforms, um, we can expand. Um, um, in particular, we can expand um, B. Actually, which way do I want to go? Um, 
we can expand um, B in terms of A and A dagger. Um, so just by, just by, again, Fourier transform, B omega is integral 0 to infinity d nu over 2 pi. And then there are some Fourier components that one can work out. They're in the notes. I won't write them on the board. They have gamma functions in them. They're not that bad. OK, now finally we insert the physics. And the physics is that, again, the adiabatic principle says that the infalling observer sees these modes empty. So the physics, the adiabatic principle, so for any black hole that's been sitting around for a while and we haven't done anything to it, uh, the, these, modes, these modes are empty. And um, from that and from this relation, it follows that the B modes are not empty. Um, and it's a short calculation. So um, I'll, I'll again let you refer to the notes for the numbers. But what you find is that the occupation number for one of these outgoing modes is thermal. with the expected temperature. OK, so, um, okay, so, so, so the whole thing is, again, the way I've done it, and again, the way Jacobson, I think, first presented it, uh, using the adiabatic uh, theorem to give you your initial condition, and then um, using the um, just, 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 just the geometry um, to turn this into a calculation of the Hawking excitation number. Now, if any of you have read Hawking's original calculation, he did it differently. He, he um, integrated the field equation. So I've integrated the field equation basically from here to here, from infinity back to the near horizon region. He integrated it back further through the infalling body, and then there's an origin here, off the origin and back to initial infinity. That's always seemed kind of fishy because this blue shifting becomes so large that at the time these modes are passing through the black hole, their, their energies are far above the Planck scale. So this is not really a valid calculation. And it, it caused a certain amount of concern. And I think Jacobson sort of said it in the right way. So you don't need to push this calculation back through the infilling body. You, it, he got the right answer. It's, it's hard to get the wrong answer, because as long as your calculation, um, as long as your calculation incorporates the adiabatic principle, it will give the right answer, even if it has the wrong physics otherwise. And so he got the right answer. But, uh, but the right physics is, is, is what, I've, what I've described here. Um, yes, please. Yes. Um, well, I'm not sure what danger you're referring to, but I mean, we could simply do quantum few. I mean, at um, well, actually, no, no, they don't, because okay, because in fact, in this calculation, the back reaction of those modes is not so large because we don't have it. You know, they escape to it. it I mean, I mean, so I mean, the the next correction to this calculation, so so. Um, Actually, let me, before I answer the question, you, I don't know what your question. Um, this is an important thing about gravity, which is that gravity is, light, is an irrelevant interaction. Like pion physics, uh, which you heard about from Raphael, its, its coupling constant is 1 over a um, mass squared. It's 1 over the Planck mass squared. And so gravity becomes weak at low energy. And so if you, you, the first question, which, I guess, which is maybe not John's question, is what about the next correction here? 
And the statement is that the net correction is suppressed by something of order L Planck squared over the Schwarzschild radius squared. So, so in that sense, one would say it's a robust calculation. But what's your question? My question is about the starting point. So, I mean, yeah. Yeah. so in my lecture, so maybe you can argue when I said it, in my talk that the only thing we know about quantum gravity is that the number of figures is greater and they're not distributed over space. Well, I'm just doing, gra I'm going to do, gra ah, this is an important question. This is an important question. See, um, the question, well, the, uh, well <laughs> it's, so I should emphasize, I am, in the spirit of the statement I just made, I am treating quantum gravity as an effective field theory. I am, I am using it, you know, that's what I'm, I'm treating it as an effective field theory just as we treat low energy pion physics as an effective field theory. What, now, John knows that this is going to break down at some point, and he's already worried. But I don't want to jump ahead like that. I want to discover the, na I want to, I want to get to the breakdown in a natural way. But hasn't it already broken down in the sense that if you really did have um, well, well, um, so, so I gave this somewhat hand-waving Bekenstein argument that says you can understand the entropy even with an effective field theory. Now, now, now this, um, and it's true. That is, if you try to put, I mean, at some, it, 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 it so, so let's not go looking for problems quite yet. We'll get into, we'll run into them soon enough. But, but just after, I, I am using low energy effective field theory until I absolutely, until it comes back and, 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 and gives me trouble. And, and, and I'm not, uh, yeah, okay. Um, good, good. Um, where was it? Okay, so that actually is, is the main point. I wanted to reiterate, so, 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 so I wanted to reiterate, by the way, this, old, this, this adiabatic theorem. I, I described to you, you know, what it is and how it's used implicitly. Um, now, now um, another way to think about the adiabatic, so, so there's an interesting commonality between um, black holes and um, the expanding universe, which is that there are modes that we're interested in, the Hawking radiation or the cosmological fluctuations. And by the way, you know, this, this was already written on the board by Eva and by Leonardo because it's really the same calculation, um, but for cosmological perturbations. So there's a scale that we're interested in, which is the Hubble scale or the inverse Schwarzschild radius, this is energy. And then there's a UV scale. And the adiabatic theorem is a theorem in the region where we understand the physics. And there's always an implicit assumption that, that, okay, there's some point beyond which we don't know what the physics is, but there's an implicit assumption that, that um, the adiabatic principle still applies. And so as the universe expands or the horizon persists and modes are basically redshifting from here down to here, the adiabatic principle says they kind of emerge empty. And as, as Lindy, Andre Lindy likes to point out, um, if this were not true, then the expansion of the universe locally would be constantly frying us with transplancian particles. So, so um, we kind of know that it's true. Although um, something Eva didn't talk about, but her, her, um, her recent work, we can't be totally sure it seems hard to avoid, but we still can't, we can't be totally sure that the adiabatic theorem applies to strings. Strings have funny properties um, when seen at high boost and so on. I mean, this comes back maybe to, to John's question about how much do I trust my ability to boost by an infinite amount. And so maybe this, in fact, is, is a place where these arguments break down. But um, at this point, that's a long shot. I mean, there, it's, it's something that, that one can try to study with calculations. So, so this is this is the physics that goes into it, um, into um, into both the calculation of the cosmological fluctuations and the calculation of Hawking radiation. By the way, there are some poorly motivated, I think now largely sort of not per followed up on models of transplancian physics in the CMB that don't respect the adiabatic principle. And again, I think they've largely been sort of ignored in the literature. Question. 
Well, well, it, what it's, well, it's, well, first off, the inverse principle says that in the regime where we can use sort of quantum field theory, if they start empty, they'll stay empty. And there's a further assumption, which is this regime that we don't fully understand. Um, they still, they, when they leave that regime, they leave that regime empty. Yes. But that's separate. That's separate. It's, it's sort of an extension of it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Be much more interesting if it were false. But um, yeah. Okay. So I didn't quite get to the information problem. I want to. Um, I have three small um, um, just elaborations on Hawking radiation, and next time I'll start on the information problem. Um, so the first is that these modes, um, these modes that we've used, the, the, the little u and little v modes only cover region 1, whereas the big U and B, big V modes cover regions 1 and 2. So, so oops, forgot the squeegee. We need some additional, additional modes. So, Here's the horizon again. So the modes I've been using are B sub omega, A sub nu, which covers the horizon smoothly. And so to really finish out the dictionary, we need um, an additional sort of inside Hawking mode. And uh, it's true that B is like A plus A dagger. This with coefficients, of course, as written before. But turning it around, A is like B plus B dagger plus B tilde plus B tilde dagger. And the statement that um, A annihilates the vacuum implies, annihilates the black hole state, implies that this is proportional to um, E to the minus It's a squeezed state, a Bogoyevov transform state. <coughs> okay, so again, that's what, what, so whenever you have this kind of Bogoyevov relation between two sets of oscillators, oops, there should be a state on this side. It acts on the vacuum for the B and B tilde modes. Okay, so whenever there's this kind of uh, Bogoyevov relation between modes for the states it implies that the vacuum for one set of modes is a squeeze state for the other. Um, in particular this implies that B and B tilde are entangled that the excitation level of, of B is equal to the excitation level of B tilde. So they're either you know, both 0, both 1, both 2. So, so this is a squeeze state, it's an entangled state. Um, by the way, actually, so, so, so um, so um, I didn't derive this, but you can sort of write this down, this, this down by inspection. First of all, it's just a general fact that this kind of mixing leads to an exponential in the raising operators. Secondly, you can get the normalization here from the number operator, which was calculated before, that gave us the Hawking flux. The other thing is I've assumed it's diagonal in these two frequencies, which follows from translation invariance, but there's something funny here. Because translation invariance is, on the outside, energy conservation. So the statement that this state sort of conserves energy, well, OK, so, so, so the creation operator for the outside mode um, adds an energy omega. It must be that the creation operator for the inside mode uh, actually lowers the energy by omega. And that's true. So, so this mode has positive energy, and this mode has negative energy. And the point is that energy is associated with a killing vector. And on the outside, that killing vector is time-like, and it's the energy as seen by an astronomic observer. But on the inside, that killing vector is space-like. 
And so what, what I'm calling the energy is something that would be measure, identified by a local observer as momentum, which can be positive or negative. And in fact, for these modes, uh, for these modes, it's negative. In fact, if this were not true, if these modes did not have a negative energy, this wouldn't be translation invariant, and the whole thing wouldn't make sense. So you will hear people say that the way that black hole evaporation works is a positive energy particle falls into the uh, a positive energy particle escapes to infinity, and a negative energy particle falls into the singularity. And it's true. It's true with the understanding that energy means this global conserved quantity. Um, the second elaboration, um, actually, I only had one. OK, sorry. Um, second and final elaboration, and then I'm actually done, is um, the, the, the massless scalar is really very, very simple because its modes are just right moving and left moving. And if you do this for other for massive scalars in 1 plus 1, or you do this for any field in 3 plus 1, then what happens is um, um, how to draw this. There's um, so, so the mode B that is we have been talking about, um, as it leaves the vicinity of the black hole, has some amplitude to backscatter and some amplitude to escape. And similarly, there's an ingoing mode. I'll call this one C. This is B. Actually, well, so this, this I'll call this one B. And so the, the, the precise relation is um, B, the thing that actually gets out at infinity, um, has some amplitude to be, in fact, this mode. It's just so it's the reflection amplitude. It's the reflection amplitude um, times the ingoing mode, and then the translation, the, the transmission amplitude uh, times what it was before. So as before. And so in particular, the number is thermal times the transition times the transition amplitude squared. By the way, r squared plus t squared is one. Okay, so um, so so this is this is normal, of course. This is this is a, a gray body factor. It's 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 why carbon is bad. Um, it's it's um, right. Yeah, yeah. No, so, no, no, it's it's that. I mean, the reason we have a greenhouse effect is because um, carbon dioxide reflects. At the temper, at, it, it reflects in the infrared, but not in the visible. So, let, so heat get, energy gets in, but doesn't get out. It's the fact that 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 that, for, that, 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 that t omega is a function of frequency. But anyway, anyway, sorry, that's getting ahead. Um, <laughs> for, for 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 any therm, so so for a black body, it radiates the black body spectrum. For a for a gray body, a body which partly reflects. The, 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 the thermal emission spectrum is correspondingly reduced. So this statement here is actually very ordinary statistical mechanics. Uh, but in the context of the black hole, where this comes about is because away from the horizon, kind of at a distance of order twice the Schwarzschild radius, uh, you have this mixing of modes. It doesn't change anything essentially what I'm going to say, but it, it's, it's something that, that to remember. Because it does come up in various discussions. Um, in particular, as you go to higher angular momenta, um, the transition factor gets very small. Uh, it's almost all reflected because of the of the centrifugal barrier. Anyway, anyway, um, so so I only really got through Hawking radiation. So next time, I will start with the information problem. Thank you. OK, so there'll be a question period um, after the break, unless there are anything urgent. Thank you. Okay. I have a question. Yeah. Um, OK, 
right, so it looks like this derivation assumes you can like factorize over things. Ooh, in what sense? Well, I mean, I would think that the, the big UV observer has a Hilbert space that extends across the horizon. Okay, yeah, yeah. But the little UV does that, not. Right, okay, right. fair enough, yes. Um, fair enough. My, my real question, though, is that, uh, so last week when Mark was talking, mm -hmm. um,